He's come a round trip about 5,000 miles to preach for us. And I love him, appreciate him. God bless you, Brother Ken. Somebody praise the Lord right now. Somebody praise the Lord. Mm-hmm. If you don't believe, I've been redeemed. Hey, just follow me down to that Jordan stream. I stepped in the water. Water was cold. Chilled my body, but not my soul. Ooh, do you remember the, Do you remember the night? Church was on fire. Holy Ghost too. From the top of my head to the sole of my feet. Do you remember? Now you're about to have my kind of church. You're just about to have my kind of church. I'd be a little too wild for you guys. I mean, you southerners, you wouldn't be ready for my... Because I would, I, would, I would be singing that song, and we do. We sing it all the time. I, I love the song. But then we would be singing stuff that you probably wouldn't approve of, so I won't do it here tonight. But it would be stuff like, Ain't no party like a Holy Ghost party because a Holy Ghost party don't stop. Ain't no... That's what I'm saying. There's something about this power of the Holy Ghost. It gets a hold of you. It will change you. You will throw your marbles out the window. You will never need to show your identification again to buy a beverage. As long as you live. I feel like there's a Holy Ghost power in here right now. Because there ain't no party like a Holy Ghost party. Because a Holy Ghost party don't stop. Okay, okay, I... I... I apologize, I forgot this wasn't a youth meeting. This is a Bible conference. Because if it was a youth meeting, we'd just go ahead. Why don't you do something? Why don't you do something?
forgiven. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Yes, Lord. right now what I want to know is are you one of those kind of churches that can only hit the high one time because if you are we just gonna stay on this high but if you're what I think you are we can stop and preach a few minutes and come right back where we are right now because this is the will of God and this is what he wants for this service but I think he's got a few more folks that he wants to talk to for just a moment All right, so I'm not the most well-traveled preacher, but on the other hand, this is not my first rodeo. Actually, I don't go to rodeos, but you understand what I'm saying. I don't care if you go, I don't, but open your Bible. American Express has a saying that they coined. That says American Express. You may even recognize it from advertisements. It says don't leave home without it. Well I'm going to tell you what we're going to talk about for just a few minutes. We're going to talk about deliverance. Don't leave church without it. I want you to go to four or five people, shake their hand and say, Deliverance. Don't leave church without it. Deliverance. Don't leave church without it. And we're not leaving without it tonight. Somebody's going to be delivered tonight. Unusual text. I know that, you know, recently somebody called me and was complimenting me about a message they heard. I said, where did you hear that? I remember the only time I ever preached it, and I sure don't remember you being there. They said, well, I wasn't. They said, uh, Brother Ham, they said they put it on the internet somewhere on some site they was listening to it and they wanted to tell me thank you I thought to myself what a world we live in you never know where your message is going so I said that to tell you this if you go away from here and say I've already heard that tonight you are a liar I ain't never preached it before and you're not supposed to do this kind of stuff reverend 
Am I supposed to go to a nice meeting like this where they done put everything together and fed all the meals and put the basket in the room and paid you for your nice meal? Done all that stuff, and then here you're going to get up here and try out something you ain't never done before. But that's what I'm going to do. I feel like I'm probably in Cajun country. I don't know what the difference between a Cajun and a redneck is. Probably about the same as a fiddle and a violin, but whatever. So I'm going to preach a redneck style, in my opinion. Maybe it's Cajun style. I don't really know. But from the book of First Chronicles, excuse me, Second Chronicles tonight, chapter 12, since you have your Bibles. I love the Bible, and I'm sorry if I get diverted sometimes talking about the Bible because I love it so much. I tell people all the time, you may think this is weird, but sometimes I sleep with my Bible. And if people think that's weird, I just look at them and say, it's probably better than some things you've slept with in your lifetime, praise God. And I was referring to teddy bears and things like that. Thank you, Elder, for the invitation to be here. Thank you for the room and all the food and... Thank you for that nice plaque. That was, that was above and beyond extraordinary. Thank you, my good friend, Brother Epley. Thank you for that wonderful message today. Thank you for driving me back and forth to the motel, being my ride. Brother Ham, thank you. For, incredible. I'll never forget it, either one of them, as long as I live. If you were not here, I seriously encourage you to get the CDs. Both of them were outstanding. And I'm very serious about getting back on that high now. I hope you're not that kind of church that they can only hit the hit the high point once. I, I don't sense that. I sense like, you know what, we can come right back there and pick that up in just a few minutes. When we get done tonight, where's the little lady that was singing in the choir? Where is she? Is she in here? Don't you run off, sister. We're going to sing that song at the end again because somebody's going to find some deliverance tonight. The Lord wants somebody to be delivered tonight. From Second Chronicles chapter 12. God bless Brother Joyner, my good friend, missionary. Love him so much. All of these ministers, let me move on quickly for the sake of this service. If you'll excuse me not taking time to notice and mention all of you, I love you all very, very, very much. Second Chronicles chapter 12. It came to pass when Rehoboam had established the kingdom and had strengthened himself, he forsook the law of the Lord and all Israel with him. And it came to pass that in the fifth year of King Rehoboam, Shishak, king of Egypt, came up against Jerusalem because they had transgressed against the Lord with 1,200 chariots. Now, folks, I don't know if you can truly picture that tonight. I don't know what the largest car dealership in Generette would have on its lot. But 1,200 cars is a lot of cars. 1,200 chariots is a lot of chariots. And it takes at least two horses for every chariot. This is a big group of folks. In addition to 1,200 chariots, he had 60,000 60, horsemen. That's a lot of horses. If you line them up side by side like the U.S. Cavalry used to ride in the Old West, I don't know how far 60,000 horses would reach. I don't know your state well enough, but I guess it might reach somewhere all, almost to New Orleans. I don't know how far 60,000 horses lined up would reach, but this is a big bunch of folks. 1,200 chariots, 60,000 horsemen, people that were without number came with him from Egypt the Lubin, the Sukkims, the Ethiopians, and he took the fenced cities which pertained to Judah and came to Jerusalem. He started at the south and cleaned house all the way to Jerusalem. Then came Shemaiah the prophet to Rehoboam and to the princes of Judah that were gathered together to Jerusalem because of Shishak and said unto them, Thus saith the Lord, You have forsaken me, and therefore, we, therefore have I also left you in the hand of Shishak. Whereupon the princes of Israel and the king humbled themselves. And they said, The Lord is righteous. And when the Lord saw that they humbled themselves, the word of the Lord came to Shemaiah, saying, They have humbled themselves. Therefore I will not destroy them, but I will grant them 
some deliverance. I will grant them some deliverance. And my wrath shall not be poured out upon Jerusalem by the hand of Shishak. Brothers and sisters, men of God, I submit to you that we are living in the day of some deliverance. I want to see the Lord begin to do a work in our churches where it's no longer some deliverance, but it's full deliverance. Full deliverance. Hallelujah. Lord Jesus, put your blessing on the word of the Lord tonight. Hover in this house. Stay here, Lord. Gather minds and hearts. Point us toward the ultimate moment when your hand is going to rest upon every hand and life in this building. Bring deliverance by the supernatural power of Jesus Christ. We pray in Jesus' name. In Jesus' name, you may be seated. I do not apologize for loving the Bible. I truly love the Bible. I do not study the Bible to preach. I'm not against that. I'm certainly happy for anyone that does. I study the Bible simply because I love it. I've studied it since I was a little young boy. I started going to church when I was about 12. When I started high school, I was 14. I never even thought about it. It was an automatic action. I just took my Bible to high school. I carried it on the top of my books. I read it during study hall. I've never been super spiritual. Wasn't doing it to impress anybody. Just liked it. Liked to have my Bible around. I like to read it. Uh, generally, I read it at night, lay it over on the bed next to me, and it's there when I wake up the next morning. Sometimes I pick it back up and read some more. I don't think the Bible is an amulet. I don't think it's a charm. I don't think it's a fetish. I don't think it's some supernatural thing that wards off evil spirits. I think it's God's Word. And I just believe in it, and I love it. And I think in times of trouble, you can, you can find nothing more comforting than the Bible. You can find nothing more strengthening. I personally believe that it can attack any addiction or any complicated problem in your life. Ephesians, this is not even my subject matter. My mind is going many different directions right now. But Ephesians talks about washing your heart with the word. Let me promise you this. Anything that you're struggling with, anything that has been long-term in your life, anything that you've shouted on Sunday night and could not get rid of for years and just felt like you dealt with the same old issue over and over again in your life, Try that scripture in Ephesians 5.24, wherever it is, about washing your heart with the word. I believe that what happens is we have deep-seated problems and needs in our life. We come to church on a Sunday night. We shout. We think it's taken care of because we had a fresh touch. But the residue of that many, many year-long problem is still in us. But when you take the word of God and you read those scriptures, for instance, if you have an anger problem and you just cannot get over that anger and you pray through on Sunday night, I got the victory, Pastor, I'm not. And, and you go back in the same week, you're struggling with it again. Get Get you some verses on anger. Read those verses every single morning and every single evening for about 30 days. And you'll find out that a difference comes to your life when you begin to wash your heart with the Word. I believe the Word is the most powerful thing that we have in our arsenal of living for God. I feel like we depend on the Spirit more than we do the Word. And I think they are a balanced attack in our life. I'm certainly not minimizing the Spirit. I think you need it. You need to pray through and talk in tongues every single day. You need the, the working of the Spirit in your life. But you also need the Word of the Lord in your life. This particular passage is written from the book of Chronicles. Chronicles is many times looked upon as the whitewashed history of the Bible because it's all good. It's basically the same material that you find in the books of the kings. The book of First and Second Samuel was one book originally. First and Second Kings was one book. First and Second Chronicles was one book. Hebrew language, much more compact, no vowels. So when they translated it, they were so large they broke them in half. They took the book of Samuel and made it first and second Samuel. First Samuel is David's pre-king years. Second Samuel is David's kingship and the years that he was the king. So they did with the kings and so they did with the chronicles. But the chronicles were written much later after the captivity. And so they, they, they left out some things in the long, sordid history of Israel when it was just, just a mess. You know, they had, they had three kings that 
reigned 40 years apiece. There was Saul, and then there was David, and then there was Solomon. For 120 years, you had a united kingdom, except for the seven years of David's civil war with the house of Saul. So roughly for 120 years, you had one nation. And at this juncture that I read to you tonight, this young man by the name of Rehoboam makes a bad decision. The nation is ripped in half, and for the next 200 years, you have two nations side by side. The northern nation... The nation of Israel has 19 kings in a row, and every single one of them are bad. After 200 years, God's finished. He's done. He's had enough. He's had enough of the Jeroboams. He's had enough of the Ahabs. He's had enough of the Jeroboam the second. And finally, he says, I'm done. Come get him. And the Assyrian army marches across the northern border in 721 B.C., comes down like a Sith takes out 46 cities, carries away 100,000 people captive, and knocks on the door of Jerusalem and says, we're coming after you too. And Rabshikeh, the the general of, of the Syrian army, he begins to taunt the people on the inside of the city of Jerusalem. And this is when Hezekiah is the king in Jerusalem and he's fearful and and he doesn't know what to do and they send him a little letter and he takes that letter and puts it on the altar. You'll remember this story and he prays about it and God speaks to Isaiah and says, you go tell him, don't worry about it. Everything's going to be all right. And so Isaiah comes over and says, that letter that Rabshika wrote, don't worry about it, said everything's going to be all right. And so they go to bed that night They wake up the next morning and look out over the city wall as the sun begins to peek over the horizon. There are 185,000 dead Assyrians. The angel of the Lord has walked through the camp of the Assyrians and killed 185,000 Assyrians in one night. Hezekiah is thrilled. He refers to Isaiah as his song in the night. This pastor will be a song in the night to you if you will allow him to be. In the moments of great confusion of your life, in the moments of great opposition, when it looks like your future is dismal and dim and untenable and unworkable, if you'll just listen to what the preacher has to say, the greatest miracles of your life will come at the beck and call of the man of God like Isaiah was to Hezekiah. And so the northern kingdom is carried away in 721 B.C. The southern kingdom lasts for another 135 years, finally carried off into Babylon, finally resurrected, and makes it on through to Jesus. I don't have time to teach you all of that tonight. I want to stop and mention this particular moment because here is a man that has never known anything but the king's house. The Bible lets us to know that Solomon was king for 40 years. And the Bible lets us to know later in the chapter that I read from tonight that this man, Rehoboam, became king when he was 41 years old. And so, obviously, you don't have to be the brightest bulb in the chandelier to figure this out. He was one year old when his father became king. And so as far as his memory reached, as far as his life was concerned, he was a king's child. He wore the best clothes. He had the best shoes. He had the best schools. He had the best training. But he also had the influence of Solomon's 700 wives and 300 concubines. And so when the kingdom is handed off to him, he lasts for five years and then his heart turns away from God. And in that moment of turning away from God, God says, I'm not going to let this happen. And so he taps Shishak on the shoulder and says, I want you to gather your war machine together and I want you to go and oppose my man in Jerusalem. And so Shishak gathers his 1,200 chariots and his 60,000 men and his innumerable company of foot soldiers and he marches like a avenging army through the southern part of Israel, taking everything in their path, burning and looting and taking everything until finally they arrive at the gates of Jerusalem. And it's at that moment that all the princes have run in and everybody's hiding like Sodom Hussein was. And they're hiding inside the palace and and the, the prophet comes to them and says, let me tell you what's going on here. You have forsook the Lord. You have forsaken the Lord and he's upset. And the Bible says, they humbled themselves. And the Lord's heart was touched. And gave them some deliverance. I don't know how it is in 
Cajun country. But where I live, it seems like most people are content to live with some deliverance. Just get the heat off enough until it's bearable. Just get the pressure off enough that I can medicate it with two Advil and a cup of coffee with cream and extra sugar and I'll get through my day. I would like to see the day arrive that we shake off the attitude of some deliverance and say, God, you are God mighty in deliverance. You can deliver an entire nation out of Egypt in one night. You can defeat Egypt in one night. You can bring about deliverance. And I'm telling somebody tonight, you don't have to go home with some deliverance tonight. You can go home with complete, full, 100% deliverance. I'm going to ask you if you'll pray with me right now that from this moment forward that the Holy Ghost would begin to move in this crowd and people's minds and hearts would begin to be pointed toward the moment when God wants to deliver somebody. Let's pray together. Holy God, right now I pray. I feel an anointing in the Holy Ghost. Hallelujah. We need deliverance, Lord. We're tired of living with some deliverance, God. We want full deliverance. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Jesus' name, Jesus' name, Jesus' name, and Jesus' name. Not just deliverance till the heat's off. Not just deliverance till the pressure's let up. Not living with the same old thing. But for once and forever, making up our mind, I'm not going home with some deliverance tonight. I am asking for deliverance. You may be seated. There is such a danger and such a sadness and such a tragedy in an incomplete message. Probably you've heard and remember from your school studies the terrible tragedy that happened when Wellington defeated Napoleon at Waterloo. Back in those days, it was messenger by horseback and ship and however they could communicate. There were no rapid means of communication. And so when Wellington defeated Napoleon at Waterloo, they wrote a message to send back to England. And the message they wrote on the paper was exactly that. Wellington defeated Napoleon at Waterloo. The messenger was instructed not to read it, not to mess with it, but to carry it straight back to England. Jumped on his horse, rode hard, got on a ship, going across that English channel, the infamous body of water with its mist and its dampness and its rain and its humidity, and somewhere that message began to blur. And when the message was finally opened and delivered, the only thing that could be read were the first two words, Wellington defeated. And it didn't read the whole message. It just said, Wellington defeated. The message was actually Wellington defeated Napoleon at Waterloo. But the other part had been blurred by the mist and the rain. And an incomplete message caused absolute terror and turmoil in England. They began to sell businesses. People began to pack their goods and move out of the country. All because of an incomplete message message. I'm asking you tonight how much damage is really done when we just have some deliverance. When we advertise that the drug addict can find deliverance. When we advertise the alcoholic can find deliverance. When we advertise your broken marriage can be put back together. When we advertise that deliverance is in the house of the Lord. When we sing our songs and we dance and cavort in the presence of the Lord about deliverance and we only have some deliverance. I am afraid that we have learned to live comfortably in the land of some deliverance. I personally believe in the church that I pastor that we could have so much more deliverance than we do. 
I want more of the deliverance from God. I want to see people delivered from depression. I want to see people delivered from fear. I want to see people delivered from anxiety. I want to see people delivered from bad marriages. I want to see people delivered from divorce. I want to see people delivered from hatred. I want to see people delivered from guilt. I want you to know that God is a God of deliverance. Hallelujah. He will give you as much deliverance as you want. And if you want book, chapter, and verse, I read it to you tonight. He gave Rehoboam exactly as much deliverance as he desired. And he only wanted some, and so God said, fine, I'll give him some deliverance. Man, I don't want to sell myself short, Elder. I don't want to live my life with the blessings of God within reach and just being too hesitant or too timid or too naive not to reach up. And if it's here tonight, if the Holy Ghost is here, if deliverance is here, I want to reach up and get it. I don't want some deliverance. I want full deliverance. Maybe see that I'm just going to preach about five or ten more minutes, and we're going to we're going to believe God's going to bring deliverance in this house. The Apostle Paul, historians rate him. This is the only part of what I have to say tonight that you might have heard some other time. This little this little clip right here. The Apostle Paul is rated historically as the third greatest man in the history of the world by historians. That's offensive to me. Because those same historians rate Jesus Christ number six. They place the Apostle Paul more important than they do Jesus Christ. That offends me because I know who Jesus is. But at the same time, I realize what they are trying to say. They are gauging it solely by the number of people that have been impacted by their words actions and their life they have looked at men like buddha or confucius or paul or lao su or uh uh, uh, uh the, the 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 man that did uh, the indian faith or mohammed or they're looking at all of that and they're simply tabulating out of the six billion people on the face of the earth who had the most impact and that's what they're trying to look at their argument is this that if it wasn't for the apostle paul that jesus ministry jesus Message, this thing called Christianity would have died a subculture of Israel's faith. That we would have all been so called Christians, but we would have just been a subdivision of the Christian faith or the Hebrew faith, the Hebrew Christians. That's their argument. I don't agree with that, but they don't have the Holy Ghost. They're just trying to figure things out. But their point is well taken that the Apostle Paul is the man that put Christianity on the map. He is the man that took it outside the bounds of the Jewish faith. He is the man that put his life on the line. He is the man that said, I'm going to take it where it's never gone before he was unapologetically the apostle to the Gentiles he was the man bold enough to say when God judges the secrets of men's heart he will judge them according to my gospel he was a man bold enough to say I didn't walk with him I didn't talk with him but I was called out of due season I spent three years in Arabia I spent 14 years working to get the approval of the pillars that were at Jerusalem and I'm here to tell you the gospel that I preach is the gospel that will save somebody he said as a matter of fact if anybody preaches any other gospel unto you than that which I have preached unto you let him be accursed just in case you were tending the baby and didn't get it he said as I said before so say I now again if any man preach any other gospel than that you have received let him be accursed you may be seated Paul Paul was born around what we would call the turn of the millennium. Somewhere around the year we would call 0 A.D. or 1 A.D. So when he was a young man, 46 years old, the church where he was in Antioch appointed he and Barnabas to go on a missionary journey. And he took Barnabas, that beautiful son of consolation, that Christian man, And they made their first missionary journey. 
beautiful moments. The church anoints him elder, send him out. They go down to the, 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 the place where you buy a ticket on a boat. And they get on a little boat. And they sail over to Cyprus. And while he's on Cyprus there, he goes to Salamis and finally to Paphos. And there he has his first Gentile convert. He has to do a little battle with a guy called Eliamis, the sorcerer. And finally Paul gets tired of messing with him and says, I'm going to strike him blind. And he strikes him blind. And, and the magistrate of the island is like, whoa! And his name is Sergius Paulus. And, and, and Paul converts him to Christianity. And, and, and at that moment, because Sergius Paulus is his first convert in his calling as the apostle to the Gentiles, he jettsons forever his Hebrew name. Never from that moment forward is he ever referred to as Saul anymore. He has made his choice. He has taken the step. From this moment on, he will be known as Paul to the Gentiles. Paul the apostle. And he gets on a boat after Sergius Paulus and he goes over to the mainland. There he goes to Phasidium. Then he goes to Iconium. And then he goes to Lystra. And there he's stoned. And they almost thought they had him and tried to kill him. He goes to Derby and recovers a little bit. Gets up from Derby. Goes right back into the fray. Goes right back to Lystra. Back to Iconium. Back to Phasidia. And on back to Jerusalem and completes about a two or three year journey visiting eight cities. And they rejoice and the, and the Lord is opening the door to the Gentiles and, and they say this is the will of God and so we're going to send you out again Paul and so he, he heads out on his second missionary journey. It's now 49 AD and he's 49 years old and he's getting ready to take his second missionary journey and, and Barnabas is ready to go and they get to fussing about Mark and John Mark and, and Barnabas wants to take him because it's his nephew it's his sister's boy and, and Paul does doesn't want to take him because he flaked out on the first time and they needed somebody to carry their suitcases like the man that, that the elder was talking about and, and they, the, the dissension is so sharp that Paul says to Barnabas well I'm not taking him and Barnabas says well if he's not going I'm not going and Paul felt so strong about it he said fine then stay and he takes Silas with him and that's why you find Paul and Silas in the jail not Paul and Barnabas so Paul starts his second missionary journey he doesn't take the boat this time. This time he goes overland. And he starts visiting those same churches that he established. Derby, Lystra, Iconium, Pisidia. But he starts branching out in some new territory. And this is when he goes to a place called Philippi. And he finds a woman washing clothes on a riverbank. Ask her what her occupation is. She said, I'm a seller of purple. My name is Lydia. He gives her the gospel. She's baptized. And she is a new convert. It's during this little sojourn that a demon-possessed girl begins to follow Paul around and begins to mock him and Silas and say this, These men are the servants of the Most High God. Now she wasn't saying it as an accolade. She wasn't saying it as an approbation. She was saying it as a mockery. And then Paul just finally got enough of it. He finally said, you know what, that's it. And he turns and he casts the devil out of the slave girl. And she is converted to Christianity. And so Philippi looks like a budding revival. They've now got Lydia. They've got this slave girl. And it looks like everything's going to go good. But all of a sudden the owners of that little ATM cash machine slash slave girl have lost their income and they're not happy at all and they go to the Romans and the rulers and they said they just cut our bank account off we want them beaten like they ought to be and the Romans without even thinking began to beat them and they beat them severely and put them in the jail in stocks and bonds this is where you always remember the story. And at midnight, the walls begin to shake and the earthquake begins to happen. And Paul and Silas, their bonds fall off. And the jailer runs and jumps in. And he says, oh, and he's going to kill himself. You remember all of this. And Paul says, oh, don't kill yourself. We are yet here. Everything's all right. And guess what? The man is baptized that night in all of his house. So now you got Lydia. You got the slave girl. You got the jailer. You got all of his house. Boy, we're going to have a revival. And the next morning, the Romans come and say, you know what? We don't like your kind around here. Get out of town. And Paul said, nice try. As a matter of fact, I'm a Roman citizen. They're like, uh, uh, oh, oh, whoo, 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 uh, uh, hmm, bad. <laughs> they did this. Sir, would you please leave? <laughs> we realize you got us over a barrel. Would you just get out of town? It's too much trouble. So the Romans asked him to leave. He said, no problem. 
So he leaves. Goes down the road to a little place called Thessalonica. He says, ah, no problem. I'll stop my next revival. And he starts one in Thessalonica. And the Jews get mad at him. And they're fussing with him. And arguing with him. And pretty soon, things got so bad, they said, you know what, Brother Paul? It's just so much trouble when you're here. Could you just leave? <laughs> so this time, the brother's asking to leave. So he leaves. And he goes down the road to Berea, a few miles down the road, and lodges with one named Justice in the house of Justice. And the same guys that gave him trouble at Thessalonica, they come down there and they say, hey, you know, and, and, and it's another big deal. You ever been around people that just, everywhere they go, it's drama. Drama. Boat rides, snakes on their hands, just all kind of drama. So at Berea, Paul thought he had a revival going. He said, these were more noble than those in Thessalonica in that they received the word with all readiness of mind and searched the scriptures daily whether those things were so. Oh, we're going to have... Nope. Berea said, you know what? It's really hot around here. Would you get in this basket? We're going to let you down over the wall by night. And, and we, don't want, we don't even want people to know you're... Just, just leave, okay? Okay. So he leaves. He's now been asked to leave Philippi by the... Romans, he's been asked to leave Thessalonica by the church. He's been asked to leave Berea by the brethren. And so he says, all right, come on, devil. Give me your best punch. I can handle it, okay? Come on. You want to fight, devil? He said, look, boys, I don't need no help. I'm going to Athens by myself. You guys go take care of those churches we just tried to start. Catch up with me later. I'm, I'm, I'm on this. <laughs> and he goes to Athens. And the trained rabbi, the learned mind, one of the most brilliant minds in the history of the world, makes up his mind, I will draw my sword and duel it out on Mars Hill and the Parthenon with the most brilliant men in the world. I'll show them that Jesus Christ is God. So he lays his plans. Oh, he's ready. This is in Acts chapter number 17. And, and he's, he's ready and he goes and he starts walking around and he's looking for an opening and he sees it. There's an altar there. To the unknown God, whom you therefore ignorantly worship, he says in his mind. He says, ah, I got it. So he just says, and he starts preaching. Boy, and he's giving it everything he's got. He's bringing every mental trick, every learned thing he's got. The most brilliant man of the earth of that time is laying it out there. And those stunned philosophers who have heard brilliant minds for over 500 years now, the, 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 the recipients of Socrates and Aristotle and Plato and men, Herodotus and, and historians and scientists and, and mental giants. Athens was the seedbed of the world. It was the schoolhouse of the world. It gave the whole world things like democracy and history and science and, and and he is wowing them. This, this preacher is blowing their mind. And they're like, whoa, wow. And then he stepped in poo-poo. He mentioned the resurrection. And when he mentioned the resurrection, they went, what? He said, yeah, he rose from the dead. They went, They began to laugh him to scorn. He was so down. When he left Philippi, the Romans asked him when he left Thessalonica, the church asked him when he left Berea, the brethren asked him. Nobody asked him to leave Athens. He said, I'm out. <laughs> and he's walking down the road. And he's 51 years old. And he thinks, what am I going to do? I thought I was on the will of God. I thought I was doing what God called me to do. That first missionary journey was so successful. And here I am. I've had four major strikeouts. And he sits down on a rock. I'm going to let my imagination go crazy here. He sits down on a rock, leans his back against a shade tree, and says, what am I going to do? He doesn't have Timothy and Silas because he left them behind. He's alone. He's worried. And he looks on the skyline. And there on the skyline is the newest city in the Roman Empire. It's only 100 years old. Caesar burned it 100 years before they rebuilt it. And he looks at that city. And he knows because of his education what's in that city. He knows that's the most wicked city in the empire. He knows that the word Corinth 
means to live shamelessly in the original language. He knows that that city is full of 700,000 heathens. It's full of mercenaries. It's full of soldiers. It's full of orientals. It's full of ungodly people and heathen. And he thinks to himself, if I couldn't start a church in Philippi, if I couldn't get it going in Thessalonica or Berea, and I couldn't do anything in Athens, how in the world will I ever crack Corinth? And somewhere on that little journey, he makes up his mind. I don't know if I can do it or not, but I am determining one thing and that alone, that I will preach Jesus Christ and Him crucified. I will not go with the words of men's wisdom. I will not use my brilliant education. I will not use any of the things that I have in the flesh. I'm going to Corinth and I'm going to preach Jesus. And if it doesn't work, that's all I'm going to do. I'm just going to preach Jesus. And when he walked into Corinth and began to preach Jesus, you know the rest of the story. In eight months he started and built the largest church in the history of the world when he went to Corinth you may be seated I'm almost done when he went to Corinth he just preached Jesus and the Lord said don't worry I have much people in this city And amazing, the roll call of names that come out of Corinth. That wicked city, 700,000. Softnesses, ruler of the synagogue. Justice lived next door. Crispus, ruler of the synagogue. Apollos, the noted orator that, that was even on a parallel with Paul. Timothy. Silas, Titus, Chloe, Stephanaeus, the ministry of saints, Fortunatus, Archelaus, Aquila, Priscilla, Phoebe. The list of names is incredible. The lowest estimate historically of the church in Corinth was 40,000 People came to God in 18 months. And there are many Bible scholars and historians that say the number was closer to 80,000 people in 18 months. All by a man who thought he was not going to succeed again. A man who had had failures and disappointments at Philippi, Berea, Thessalonica, and Athens was now sitting in the middle of 70 or 80,000 people with some of the highest profile people in the city in his congregation. While he walked those streets, Seven miles away in a little town called Syncria was a sister by the name of Phoebe. Phoebe came to him one day and sought him out. He was a tent maker. She said, Paul, I just want to let you know that I'm going to be absent from services for a while. I'm going to get on a boat and go to Rome. And Paul said, oh, Sister Phoebe, If you're going to go to Rome, would you mind taking a letter from me? And she said, oh, I'd be glad to. And so he decides to write a letter of introduction of himself to the church at Rome. That's all it was supposed to be. Hi, my name's Paul. Can't wait wait to meet y'all. But when he sat down to write, the Spirit of God came on him. And when he picked up his pen, he wrote a little book that is the size of your average newspaper. If you can read a newspaper in a day, you can read the book of Romans in one day. That's about the size of Romans. It is not placed in your Bible accidentally after the book of Acts. Brilliant scholars poured over those books And said, this one needs to go immediately after the book of Acts. 
It needs to be placed right after the writings of Luke, the only Gentile writer of the New Testament that wrote 25% of the New Testament. It needs to go right there. And Paul wrote the book of Romans. The book of Romans is the condensed version of the grand view of God. When you read the book of Romans, there is everything that you need to see in microscopic viewpoint. There is the will of God, the purpose of God, the creation of God. On and on we could go. The role of the Gentiles, the role of the Jews, the final, how to live, on and on. And when he put down his pen, he had not written a letter of introduction, but he had written the gospel according to Paul, the book called Romans. And he wrote that while he was in his sojourn there in Corinth during that 18 month journey while he was there in Corinth and thousands of people are coming into the church he's walking up and down the streets of Corinth he's seeing orientals and Jews and sailors and merchants and he's seeing that temple on the on the on the hillside that serviced mankind with 1,000 prostitutes and it's foreign heathen gods and, and he's looking at all of that and he's looking at the architecture and he's looking at the beauty of the city and the high Roman official and he looks at the Gentile world and he writes Romans chapter 1 and he says this is what happens when man does not have God this is what happens when men do not worship the creator but they worship the creature men begin to get with men women with women working that which is unseemly it's debauchery it's ungodliness this is what happens when mankind does not have a savior Then he picked up his pen and started writing in chapter 2. And he looked at the Jews from the synagogue and Christmas and justice and seas and the other ones that had come in. And he realized that all of your Jewish faith is not the answer. And all of your law is not the answer. And all of your sacrifices did not help you. And so to the Jew, he also writes, the answer is Jesus Christ. And in chapter 3, he picks up his pen and writes the words that mean so much to all of us. For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. If you're a Gentile, you're a sinner. If you're a Jew, you're a sinner. You need the gospel. There is none righteous, no, not Want our musicians to come back up. When Ronald Reagan was governor, and later when he was president, his wife, Nancy, was very active as a first lady. In fact, for those of you that were too young, you may not know this. She was the first first lady, the first president's wife. To address the United Nations. She was very much involved in social things. She kind of set the template for what president's wives should be. Sit down, son. Leave them chairs alone. We'll get them chairs out here in a minute. Thank you. And Nancy Reagan decided to visit a school in upper New York. And she did, and her heart was touched by children from the inner city whose lives are damaged by drugs. Then she went to a school in Los Angeles, saw the same. And she made up her mind, i got to do something. And she was talking at that school in Los Angeles, and a young fourth grade girl raised her hand and said, Mrs. Reagan, can I ask you a question? She said, yes. She said, how do you not take drugs? My family takes drugs. It's in my neighborhood. My brothers sell it. She went on this long dialogue. She said, how do you not take drugs? Nancy Reagan's answer became a government program that now is budgeted $2 billion a year. She said, just say no. After everything the government could come up with, the most effective deterrent to drugs is not methadone. It's not other 12-step programs. It is just 
say no. Could I tell you tonight, mankind does not need a program. Mankind needs a promised redeemer. Could I tell you tonight that mankind does not need the therapy of psychobabble. Mankind needs the therapy of Pentecost straight from the upper room right into their heart. Could I tell you that mankind does not need government assistance. Mankind needs God's government on this earth. Can I tell you that mankind does not need 12 steps. Mankind needs one step. And that's a step to an altar where you can have an experience with God and He can change your life. And you might say that's because you're a redneck preacher and you don't even understand the 12-step program and you don't even know. Well, let me just defend myself for a moment, all right? I spent 10 years in California getting certified as a drug counselor, working inside the jail, going in there for every single week for 10 long years. I worked with probation, did drug testing. I could tell you more about the 12-step than you can tell me. But I'm here to tell you the 12-step is not the answer. I'm here to tell you that one step is the answer. It's still in God. It's still in deliverance. 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 Don't leave church without it. Can I tell you mankind doesn't need more pills? Can I tell you that mankind needs more power? We need Holy Ghost power. Can I tell you that mankind doesn't need more alternatives? We need an altar. Hallelujah. We don't need more alternatives. We need an altar. Can I tell you that mankind doesn't need booze? Mankind needs a baptism of the Holy Ghost. Can I tell you man doesn't need drugs? He needs deliverance. It is the power of God that delivers. Would you stand with me? I was in California. Young man came up. He's obviously high. Right over here. He came up, went over to pray for him. He looked up at me. He said, I'm high on heroin. I can't get off of it. Eyes were dilated. You could tell he was higher than a kite. He said, I need help. You don't have to believe me, but I can give you the pastor's name and phone number if you don't. Call him and ask him. We laid hands on that young man, and while I watched, his pupils dilated correctly. While I watched, I could see the drugs leave his body. I watched tears start flowing down his face. I watched while we laid hands and prayed for him. He lifted his hands. He received the power of the Holy Ghost. God delivered him from heroin in one step in one night he never went back to it he's living for God today in the church there in California don't tell me that there's not power in deliverance the deliverance is in the Holy Ghost the deliverance is in God the deliverance is in the gospel if you're a Gentile if you're a Jew if you're a drug addict if you're an alcoholic it doesn't make any difference the deliverance is in Jesus I know a man in my home church. The last time he drank. We're not talking a social drinker here. The last time he drank. He was not sober. For 18 months. He never sobered up. For 18 months. Verbal Bean was preaching a revival. My home church. He staggered in the back door drunk. Nothing more than to cause trouble. He got to the front of the church that night. Verbal being laid hands on him and prayed for him. Are y'all listening to me? 18 long months he was drunk. They prayed for him. He sobered up while they prayed for him. He got the Holy Ghost that night. He got baptized that night. That was in 1967. He had a little old boy by the name of Johnny that some of you may know. His name is Johnny King. He pastors in Calgary, Alberta. 
that was Johnny's dad that came that night drunk. But the Holy Ghost sobered him up. Don't tell me that this gospel will not deliver. It'll deliver a drug addict. It'll deliver an alcoholic. I don't want to say too much because it would be totally inappropriate. But let me just tell you, i got a family in my church right now that if I told you all the things that went on, you would say their marriage would never work. A year and a half ago, it looked like it would never work. It was so badly destroyed, torn up, and I was so aggravated, I told the wife, whatever you want to do, go ahead and do. I'll stand with you, whatever you decide to do. Can I tell you that through the power of the Holy Ghost, that marriage is together today? Can I tell you that it's better than it's ever been? And it wasn't a counseling session, and it wasn't a... It wasn't medication, and it wasn't psychotherapist. It was the Holy Ghost. It was deliverance. Deliverance. Don't leave church without it. Don't leave here tonight without it. Deliverance is here tonight. We are dealing thing we're dealing with things right now that are so difficult for us as a church. I can introduce you to a man that I just got an email from yesterday that said I want to celebrate 6 months of victorious living. For 13 years, he was bound by pornography. 13 years, he couldn't shake it and he couldn't quit it. But when he found Jesus Christ, he said, for the first time in 13 years, I am free. Six months is my birthday. He said, I just want to celebrate it a little bit. You know where he found the answer? He found it in deliverance. In deliverance. In deliverance. Deliverance. Don't leave church without it. Don't leave church without it. For all of you that think your problems are too severe for the church. If you think your problem is too complicated for your pastor. Let me just tell you. That for 2,000 years years this Bible and the Holy Ghost and a preacher solve people's problems if you want to argue about this see me out back it's what I wrote my thesis on psychology or the Bible you talking to the right guy I'm telling you, psychology will point you to yourself. Psychology will point you to your problem. Psychology will blame your mother and your daddy and all of that stuff. I'm telling you, the Bible will point you to God and say the answer is in Him. The Holy Ghost deliverance is in Him. I'm here to tell you where the answer is. It's in deliverance. It's in deliverance. Not some deliverance, but complete deliverance. There's deliverance here tonight. There's deliverance over drugs. There's deliverance over alcohol. There's deliverance over marriage trouble. There's deliverance over pornography. But there's also deliverance over depression. There's deliverance over anger. There's deliverance over fear. There's got a deliverance over guilt. I got a new saying for you this week. I hope you practice it this week. Deliverance. Don't leave church without it. Deliverance. Don't leave church without it. Deliverance. Don't leave church without it. When you walk through the back door, deliverance. Don't leave church without it. When you walk out and get in your car and you go home, deliverance. Don't leave church without it. If you don't have it, come back in and get it. You need the deliverance, not some deliverance, total deliverance. And it shall come to pass that whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be delivered. That's not my word, that's his word. And it shall come to pass that whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be delivered. Upon Mount Zion shall be deliverance. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he hath anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He sent me to heal the brokenhearted and to preach deliverance. Somebody come up with me tonight. Somebody come on up around the front. Somebody come on up. Deliverance is in the house tonight. Come on. Come on. 
Can you go back to where we were earlier and the Spirit of the Lord was asking you to worship? Come on up. Come on, make your way to the front. Deliverance.
to the soul of my feet. Felt the spirit moving all over me. If you don't believe, I've been redeemed. Follow me down to the Jordan Street. Stepped in the water, the water was cold. Chill my body, but now my soul. I got the river. I got the river. I got the river. I got the river. The river, I've got the river. Well, I've got the river. Well, I've got the river. You should have been there when I prayed through. Church was on fire with the Holy Ghost, too. From the top of my head to the sole of my feet, felt the Spirit moving all over me. If you don't believe, I've been redeemed. Follow me down to the Jordan Street. Stepped in the water, the water was cold. Chew my body, but not my soul. I've got the river. 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 Jesus said it. Jesus said it. Believe on me. Believe on me. Scripture said it. Scripture said it. Scripture said it. Scripture said it. Out of your belly. Out of your belly. Out of your belly. Out of your belly. Go, 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 go. I got the river. When I pray through Church was on fire And the Holy Ghost too From the top of my head To the sole of my feet Felt the Spirit moving all over me If you don't believe I'm being redeemed Follow me down to the Jordan Street Stepped in the water The water was cold Chill my body But not my soul I got the river I got the river I got the river the river should have been there when I prayed through. Church was on fire and the Holy Ghost too. From the top of my head to the sole of my feet, felt the Spirit moving all over me. If you don't believe I've been redeemed. Follow me down to the Jordan Street. Stepped in the water, the water was cold. Chill my body, but not my soul. I got the river. I got the river. I've got the river. I got the river. Jesus said it. Jesus said it. Believe on me. Believe on me. Scripture said it. Scripture said it. Scripture said it. Scripture said it. Out of your belly, out of your belly, out of your belly, out of your belly. Go, 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 go. I got the river. I got the river. I got the river. Should have been there when I prayed through. Church was on fire and the Holy Ghost too. From the top of my head to the sole of my feet. Felt the Spirit moving all over me. You don't believe I've been redeemed. Follow me down to the Jordan Street. Stepped in the water. The water was cold. 